Here is Pastor Arnold Murray. We're going to talk about vengeance. You know, in this generation, some of the so-called higher critics are trying to say, well, that word vengeance actually means to restore, to make what's right. And they're trying to, you know, soft pedal it and give it a different meaning totally that, you know, God intends to restore, all right, and you know what he's going to do? He's going to kick the dragon out, okay? That's the way he restores. He takes that that's not fit and gets rid of it. And that's what, that's what vengeance truly means. It always has, and it always will be. The prime of it is even a grudge. And God has a grudge with some uh, ways of teaching, the way some people do, the way some people react. There will be some prophecy woven in this, and some of it's going to be a little deep. I'm going to let you pick your own level and uh, go with that, okay? We're going to talk about the day of vengeance. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 21. I need not remind you of what the message is within that chapter. Luke chapter 21 is the equivalent or the side profile view of Mark 13 and Matthew 24, which has to do with you being delivered up, with you, um, the fact that they can't harm a hair on your head, that God himself will put words in your mouth. You're not to premeditate what you will say. But I only want to pick up a part of that, and I bring you up to speed on that because you already know. But I want, I want to center in on verse 19 of Luke 21, all right? Verse 19, listen to it carefully. In your patience possess ye your souls. Do you know what that means? Don't get in a hurry. If you get in a hurry to accept some Messiah, you're going to lose your soul, unfortunately, because the false Christ is coming first. You've got to be patient. Now, he's, he's, he is good as an actor, and he's going to deceive a lot of people, and Jesus himself said in Mark 13, if it were possible, he would deceive even the elect. He's sharp. He performs miracles that no human has ever done, and it's going to be done in the sight of man. So be patient. You know from beforehand it was going to happen, don't let them see you sweat. Your soul depends on it. Verse 20, And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. And this speaks of the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, which means the false Christ standing in the holy place claiming to be Jesus. That's what the desolator standing in the holy place is. He's not supposed to be there, and that is an abomination. That's why that we that are true Christians do not find it tempting. We don't find anything about Satan tempting. But that's where he will stand. Now, that's an important fact, and we're going to come back to that desolation after a considerable study here. So make a mental note and park it there. Verse 21, then let them which are in Judea, that's the state within where Mount Zion lies, Jerusalem, flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in these countries enter therein too. Why? Well, Jesus made it clear in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. He said, they said, look. Take a look at these buildings, teacher. And he said, don't marvel. There's a day coming when there's not going to be one stone left standing atop another, meaning I'm going to cleanse it. And that's cleanse it of the false Messiah. When he sets his kingdom up on Mount Zion, it's going to be cleared down to not a, you know, what does it take to get not one stone on top of another? We've got to turn it to sand. Okay? It's going to be cleansed, and that's why you don't want to be near the place. Unfortunately, some of you will have to witness there, but don't worry. 
God's wrath is not against you. He's not angry at you, and you're protected. Doesn't matter. If you got business there, go there. No problem. Have the faith to know and understand that. Now, that deception will not be a light thing. And if you think it is for you, then you're probably setting yourself up for a kind of a hard trip. That deception is severe. I mean, you know, when, when a supernatural entity begins to form, perform tricks and miracles, it's going to be awesome. Your own relatives are going to plead with you because they're going to think you're following Satan and this, this is Jesus. They're going to come and work on you like never before. They're going to ask you if you've lost your mind. Some of your own family and nearest of relatives that are deceived by him. You know what? He's going to look very much like the picture you see hanging on walls of what Christ looks like. He's one of the most beautiful of the cherubims. God created him that way. So he is a deceiver coming out the gate from the word go. And the deception will be severe. Let's continue on. Verse 22. For these be the days of vengeance. Now this is why we came here. These be the days of vengeance. What, what vengeance? Well, let's continue. That all things which are written may be fulfilled. In Mark 13, it would tell you learn the parable of the fig tree. Because all things will be fulfilled, all that is written will come to pass in the generation of that fig tree. That fig tree beginning the year of our Lord, 1948. It's getting a little bit of gray hair on it getting on along in years, but still that would be only um, um, a short time to our Father, a very short time. But nevertheless, it's knocking on your door, and it's God getting your attention saying, wake up and smell the coffee. Wake up and smell the roses. Things are happening. This is a sign when you see. These things come to pass, know that it must be, and all things written may be fulfilled. And it's going to. It's going to happen. When? Concerning the days of vengeance. One more verse. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And you all know what that consists of. It means there's going to be spiritual impregnations. As Jesus himself would warn in Matthew 24, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. They're going to be giving and taking in marriage again with the fallen angels. The Nephilim. And they're, it, it, it will happen again. They're going to be giving and taking in marriage. And that's a literal marriage. A spiritual marriage as well. Now, you're supposed to be a virgin bride when Christ returns, right? You've been taught that since you were a child. How do you think Christ is going to feel if he comes back and you're impregnated with the teachings of Satan? You think he's going to be proud of you? You think you can consider yourself as saved? I don't think so. I think you'll have to wait till the end of the millennium if that be the case. God never spoke literally of it being a sin for a mother to carry a child in her womb that was natural. But this is why the flood came to be in the beginning, was because of the unnatural. That is to say, Nephilim and Geber were born from those unions. Well, Christ just isn't going to put up with it. He wants a virgin bride, and he will have a virgin bride, because that's the only kind of bride he will have. And we're speaking now in a spiritual sense, okay? But I add that so that you see the nearness between the day of vengeance and the actual temptation, the hour of temptation, of God's elect in the final hour when all things that are written must come to pass. 
It's going to happen in your generation. It's going to. It is written, I trust that word. Nobody knows the date, the time, the hour, but you are supposed to see the signs if you have wisdom. Now, turn with me to Luke chapter 4. <clears throat> Do you remember we spoke this morning of Satan tempting Christ in the wilderness for 40 days? And basically what that temptation consisted of was the writings of Moses. Now as we open here in this fourth chapter of Luke, Christ has gone to the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted of Satan to show you how that when the day of vengeance came, you would not be deceived prior to that, okay? The day of vengeance ends the desolation. Let me say that again. The day of vengeance ends the desolation of the abomination, or better said, translated, the desolator will come to his end, and that that is abominable will be over for a period on the day of vengeance. So you must think of it in that light. The day of vengeance is the day Christ returns. So you've got some things you've got to cut before the day of vengeance, before Christ returns, and naturally it is the witness. Jesus, after being tempted of Satan, the very first thing he did is the act that we're about to read of. And in that fourth chapter, I want you to take up with verse 16. This is after the temptation, after he has told Satan to get behind him. Verse 16 of Luke 4 reads, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as, what, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. It was kind of his custom, common for him to do this. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, which is to say Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written. I, I want you to know he has been tempted by Satan in this same chapter. He has gone to the synagogue, and he opens this book up to this place purposely. He wanted you to know the message that he's about to deliver, okay? And naturally, it has to do with that temptation to give you the final instructions, or that is to say additional instructions as to how you should maintain your life. Then he reads in verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's to say the humble, those that will listen. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. God's word will do that. To preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. That's to say those that are blind to the truth, if you would. To set at liberty them that are bruised. That is to say, to help them that need help. Christ does that. That's what he wants to do. And if you walk in his footsteps, that's what you should do. Verse 19, to preach, listen carefully, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What is the acceptable year of the Lord? You should know. You know, what is it? Well, it is the year that the events come to pass that he has warned you about. God himself is not going to play tricks on you. It's going down exactly as it's written. You've got the plan of the day. The commander-in-chief has written it. It is the set of orders that people will follow whether they want to or not as for as that that pertains to the acceptable year of the Lord. It's going to happen that way. Now, what was he, all of you know where he was quoting from in the book of Isaiah. He stopped short in the middle of a sentence. 
It is the end of that sentence that is important. Let's continue on to see his words after having read that, though. Verse um, 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, 20, and he closed the book. And he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them were, that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Why? Many might say, well, why would they do it? Well, he stopped short. He didn't finish reading it. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now we simply have to turn to Isaiah 61 to see why he did not read the rest of it. And it has very much to do with you in this generation. Chapter 61, the great book of Isaiah, verse 1, and it reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. That's the humble. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Remember, this is where he was reading. See, remember, remember it? To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, that are blind to the truth, to give them that truth, to help them, to comfort them. Verse 2, sharpen up for me. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma, and, this is where he quit, where, let's finish it, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. The day of vengeance is going to be a comfort to those that love God. It is real easy for Christians to put themselves on guilt trips or fear trips, worry trips, because, I, I don't know, is it, is it that we want to do what's right and if we do mess up and do something wrong like all of us do occasionally, well, you just blew the whole thing. Well, that isn't the way it is. God's a forgiving God when you repent. But he intends that you are protected. That's what the sermon was this morning. He takes you under his wing. He doesn't like it when people pick on you, as we cover. He is only angry at his enemy. And that's what the day of vengeance is about is to right that that is wrong. Let's continue on concerning the day of vengeance. Three, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. What would they, why would they be mourning? Because Satan's sitting there. Because he's de deceiving families destroying truth or tr attempting to. That's why they're, and he intends to make it right with those people that, that they f holding and being patient, they possess their souls. The oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Let me, let me ask you a question. Who did that planting? There's a planting of the Lord. The Lord planted them, of course. Why? Their election. Why? They can't stand Satan. They couldn't stand him in the first earth age, if you don't understand that. Put it on a shelf. They don't, under, they don't uh, uh, care for him now or anything about him. We find him an abomination to see what he does to little children, to see what he does to cities, to see what he does to nations. And we want it corrected. That's what God's going to do. But he's not angry at his election, those that be Christians, Christ men. That is to say, the anointed of Almighty God. Verse 4, and they shall build... God shall build, no, and they shall build the old waste. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. Here we do have things being made right. But I, the thing I want you to note is God's not doing it by himself. 
He's got helpers. How about you? Want to enlist? Five. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. This means that all people will be working together. There's a tremendous amount of cooperation within this. Everybody looks out for everybody's good. That's the way God wants it. He wants everyone to have it good. Six, but ye shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Speaking of God's election, ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, strike the word Gentiles, and write nations. Ye shall eat the riches of the nations, and in their glory shall you boast yourselves. Why? It's all one nation, and it's God's country. And God, Christ will have returned as King of kings and Lord of lords. Verse 7, for your shame you shall have double. That's the, that's the inheriting privilege of first fruits. And for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. How long? Everlasting joy. That's when the day of vengeance takes place. And that's what the day of vengeance brings you. Not pain, not sorrow, everlasting joy. It's a great day to look forward to. It means the return of your Savior. That's what we all work forward to, and I don't believe it's all that far off. I guess the big question that concerns me are what are we going to be doing or what are you going to be doing between now and then? Because you need to lead your family into a little bit of readiness whereby they are spiritually prepared to not be deceived, okay? And in some cases you can't help it, but it doesn't hurt to plant seeds. Verse 8, for I, the Lord, love judgment. I love to do what's right. I hate robbery for burnt offering. And I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. What does he mean he hates robbery for burnt offering? He hates people that rip people off for money for religious reasons. I mean, it upsets God tremendously. And it seems to me like that in this present generation, we're sure getting a lot of it. A lot of people that in the name of religion, all in the world they can do is beg. Quote one scripture and then beg for two weeks. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how. And God hates that. And they might as well be warned. It sure don't make you very popular to warn them. But... I'd rather be popular with God because the covenant is eternal. In verse 9, and their seed shall be known among the, the nations. The word Gentile should be translated nations in all cases in this chapter. And their offspring among the people, all that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I want you to be a part of that. You should be. If you're one of God's elect, I can answer you, for you, you are. But it, we must keep up to speed. We must keep ourselves informed. And we must be ready. So let, let's just analyze what we've gleaned from that. Jesus stopped reading because at the first advent was for salvation. And we've had salvation for 2,000 years, approximately. And it's wonderful. It's great. But there is an acceptable year that will be the time of vengeance. And we're closing on that. All the signs point in that direction. But what he's assuring you, you don't have anything to worry about. It's good for you. It brings you blessings, not harm. God, just as sure as he allowed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be cast into that fiery furnace, they weren't singed. Why? Because Christ walked with them. Neither do you 
have to worry about anything of bowing your little knee to Baal, of uh, bowing to the temptation, because you're a child of God. And you know and understand, and you are not going to be deceived because Christ taught you the acceptable year of the Lord. And you are going to hold that line. You will not allow yourself to be tempted, for Christ showed you the 40 days in the wilderness that he withstood Satan, and it was a snap. Satan's afraid of you when you bristle, so bristle a little. Get used to it. Used by that, I simply mean, in translation, exercise the power and authority that God has given you. You're not a wimp. You're a powerhouse. There are no giants to you in the world. You're a giant to the world. And if people could only see spiritually what is above, the people of God. All right, now, uh, let's, let's get on with this just a little bit here. And we're going to go with, uh, back to Isaiah. Let's back up a little bit to chapter 34. Dennis, I left my water over there. Would you bring it over, please? I, I don't know why. It seems like when Loretta's here, I forget a lot of stuff. Huh? <laughs> No, no. Anyway, he'll bring it out here to me. I mean, he's a good boy. Okay. Uh, 34. Chapter 34, verse 1. Let's go with it. Come near, ye nations, to hear, and hearken, you people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world, and all things that come forth of it. In other words, the world of man the world that we have allowed to come to be. For the indignation, in verse 2, the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. And this is properly translated. And his fury upon all their armies, he hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. In other words, he has put them under a divine band. Do you know what that band is? It's the day of vengeance. And that's why you should be familiar with it. I think we're coming up to that time that we're probably under the edge of that band. Verse 3, their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountain shall be melted with their blood. You know about the battle of him and Gog. You know that we're talking about the time of change of bodies. It don't make any difference at all. Sinner saints and good bad on the day of a vengeance are going to put on a spiritual body. It's going to happen. Verse 4, and all the host of heaven, this is important, sharpen up for me. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. What is the host of heaven? It's angelic beings. It's not here on earth. It means that the, a host translates army. The armies in heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. You know what? It's going to squeeze out the bad. And it's going to happen before the day of vengeance. And all their host shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the uh, fig tree. It means a fading fig, one that's wilted, just like Jesus put the quietus to the one and it wilted. Because fig stands for that that's hidden, and God doesn't want anything hidden from you. You dwell in the secret part of his dwelling. And there should be no secrets to you. And that's why we study, study, study. And he gives, gives, gives knowledge, information, wisdom, and blessings. So God intends, and from this we have no doubt, he's talking about the day of vengeance, the day of correction. 
5, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Where? Did it say earth? In heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. And of course, Idumea is, uh, uh, Idumea plays on the Hebrew word for blood, red, and it has to do with Esau. And it has to do with the red nation that has in the past loved communism to such a point that, and drives God out, it thinks. And we see great movement in that country even today. This has nothing to do with the people, but a way. Six, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams, for the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra, Basra being a fortress in Edom, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. The unicorns, but the unicorn, and the unicorn shall come down with them. It means the wild ox, there's no such thing as a unicorn, and the bullocks with the bulls, and um, their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness, Verse 8, here's why we came here, and then I will explain. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy in Zion. That is the acceptable year of the Lord. What he's saying is there, with this change, the very land itself is going to be fertilized with the waste, with what's left. And, of course, we move on into the spiritual millennium age. Boy, what a time of teaching that's going to be. Hmm. But God is not happy with what's going on here. And it is so very important that you give him at least a little pride among his children to recognize what is happening and stand the line and serve him. To, he says, they shall help. They shall bring it to pass. They shall witness. They shall testify. Who's the they? It only fits one group. People that study God's Word. People that follow God's Word. That is to say, God's election. Kings and queens of the ethnos that will lead their people. It's such a beautiful time to live. The prophets wanted to live today. And you are. I don't know. What a time to live. The day of vengeance. The acceptable year of the Lord. I could say the time Christ returns. That's what it's talking about. And one more verse, verse 9. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. The reason I wanted to cover that is because you know and understand it's when God rains hail and brimstone from heaven to destroy uh, those at Haman, Gog, and Armageddon. That's, that's the point. That's what we're talking about. That, my friend, is the acceptable year of the Lord. But he has given you very clear, I'm going to even change the phraseology, clear-cut instructions to stand the line, to be a witness, to be a testimony. And we're going to go more into that before we complete this uh, Passover. Let's, let's turn on to chapter 35. Chapter 35, verse 1. The wilderness and the solidarity, the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. I look forward to that. I want to see it. I want to see the earth change. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing the glory of Lebanon, and shall be given unto it the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. He's returning. He's coming back, and he's going to make things right. You know, it is a beautiful thing to go out into the deserts of this country, and I call them deserts, some wouldn't, but 
to find uh, petrified palm stumps on the top of a mountain in New Mexico. That's awesome. This used to be such a beautiful place. It is now, but not even compared to what it was before, before the overthrow, before Satan messed it up. Boy, is it ever going to be beautiful when we put it back right, when God puts it back right. Three, strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Comfort everyone with the good news. Good things are about to happen, and they're going to happen in your lifetime. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Now, did it say God's returning in vengeance and he's going to destroy you? No. Those that deserve salvation shall be saved. The day of vengeance is a beautiful, happy day for us. But oh, woe to those that are found with child that day, spiritually speaking, and have followed after Satan. We're coming to that time. We've talked about it for a long time. We've taught it for a long time. But God is fine-tuning it, and he expects you to fine-tune your set which is to say your mind, and understand it's a good time. Verse 5, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. On the first day of the millennium, every knee will bow to the true Christ. They're going to know what a crud they've been following. Verse 6, then shall the lame man leap as a heart. That's a deer and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. That's a spiritual stream as well. And naturally, when we are in our spiritual bodies, there are no imperfections. And God loves the handicap. Many people think, well, why did God curse? No, they give a better witness than you do. When a handicapped person can say how precious the Father is to them, and they understand that God has a reason for all things, it puts the rest of our witnesses to shame in a sense, understand. But there's not going to be any handicap in, an, in after the day of vengeance because of the change of bodies. And the parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons, uh, where each lay shall, he gray, shall be grass with reeds and rushes. You know, you can see this if you're interested in archaeology. You can see it used to be that way. And in highway shall be there, and a way, and that means a trail, a path, and it shall be called the way of holiness. Hey, it's already open to some. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. What, what it really, I think it should be translated, the fools won't go astray there, because they're going to know better. They're going to be taught. And that's where you come in, in part, even after the day of vengeance, as ministers of God the priest of God, as it is written. Verse 9, No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous uh, beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Why? There won't be anyone around but the redeemed. Okay? They're not going to walk that path. Okay? We know from Ezekiel that they can't approach Christ through the millennium. You know it. You've read it. Ezekiel 44, you have to pay a little penalty even if you go to one of your relatives that didn't make it to give them a little boot, okay? Verse 10, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So, vengeance, let it come. 
to you it is good. And to the world even it is good because it needs straightening out. It deserves to be straightened out and only, quite frankly, God can do it. It's gone that far. And I look forward to that time when we put off the flesh, quite frankly. I'm not in any hurry. We do it God's way, understand. But that's going to be precious, you know it? To never have any pain, like we know pain today, uh, that these old flesh bodies squeak back at us for and so forth. But just a good time all the way around. There's not going to be a, a lion there that would destroy something because there will be no carnivores there. The lion's actually going to eat grass if we were to go further back in uh, Isaiah to chapter 11. It would tell us that because there's no flesh eaters there. Okay. So we see that the day of vengeance of the Lord, he's going to set things straight. Basically, that's what it means. Now, I promised you we were going to go back to that day of desolation. Turn with me to Daniel. I know it's uh, getting a little bit later, and I want you to really sharpen up for me, for there's just a few short minutes left in this lecture. And I'm going to put quite a bit to you, and it's up to you as to what you gain from it. I want to go to the book of Daniel, okay, in the Minor Prophets. I want to go to chapter 9. Daniel was so wise and he wanted so to understand. And God so loved him that he gave him the formula of figuring the acceptable year of the Lord. But I want to go here where we started from when it said, when you see the desolation well, here is the description of it. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. You're all familiar with it. And he shall confirm the covenant with many. This is not Christ, but the false Christ. For one week, and this is the 70th week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Even unto the consummation... That means the end, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That's not what it says in the Hebrew. Basically, in the Hebrew, just for the sake of time, I'm going to say it says, and Dr. Moffat translates it so. Dr. Bullinger did as well. That in the middle of the week, the false Christ, that's what's the middle of the week? Three and a half years, okay? Only that's been changed now because of Revelation 9. He's going to make a covenant and cause the oblation to stop. Why? Because they're not going to be taking communion at Passover to the true Christ, but to the false. It would stop. It's going to hurt our Father a great deal when that takes place. And the desolation comes in on the wings, filthy bird, of the desolator, which is one of Satan's names, as the false Messiah. Daniel sure wanted to understand that. And in, in, on into the 10th chapter, he prayed. He went up, he fasted. He prayed for three weeks. Three full weeks. He couldn't get an answer. Nothing happened. It was 21 of Daniel's days. How long is 21 of Daniel's days? We know from the formula that we are given that it's 1.48 of our years approximately. And that figures out a little better than 31 years. 31 years it took to build from the working up to the day of vengeance up until Michael acted. Oh, what did Michael do? Well, he threw Satan out onto this earth. And that's when our trouble really starts. 31 years it took. 
chapter 10, you're familiar with it basically. The angel begins to talk, but the prince, um, verse 12 of chapter 10, Daniel. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. It took him 31 years to get there, but he, he heard it. God has an acceptable year. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, twenty-one days, three weeks. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. And I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. You're all familiar with this, with this. He went back, he did fight. Daniel chapter 11 gives you, in verse 21, gives you the promise that the false Christ shall come. Verse 21 reads, And in his estate shall stand up the vile person, Satan, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Religion working miracles, and with the arms of a flood shall they be overflowing from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And on it goes. Daniel tries desperately to understand. It talks about from verse 31 through 35, your exploits, how that you're going to be delivered up, how that 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 is right is going to be turned upside down and made wrong by the world press and false teaching and so forth. But then to explain it in chapter 12, verse 1, listen carefully. In other words, verse 45 of chapter 11, let's, let's read it so you understand. He shall put, he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. In other words, the false Messiah is going to come to an end. Nobody's going to help him. Why? They're going to see him for the fraud he is. How does that happen? Chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time, same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. In other words, the day of vengeance. The testimony of our Father happens in the fifth trump. Okay? Not the action, the testimony. I'm not going to say that the fifth trump is 31 years long, but I'm going to say it's very close to it. I think you can count on that. And I'm not going to say a great deal about it because I'm not one to set dates, but it behooves one if they have knowledge and understanding that they should at least give warning. And um, the fifth trump being that time of testimony that people were warned that these events would happen, then it's not a very long period of time. And it's a period of time you need to think about, and you need to pray about. Because it is Michael <clears throat> that will cast Satan from heaven. You know that. That's got to happen before the day of vengeance. We got some work to do, and God is preparing you for it. I'm going to tell you something. Do not miss. Do not miss the lecture tomorrow afternoon. It's important to you, very important. And it will continue from this place, basically, as from day one this morning. It will all flow like honey. 
and it has to do with you, your place, and what you are doing. Free introductory package. Say this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. to be a beautiful angel in the garden of God until pride turned him ugly. Because of Satan's sin, he became a scraggly old boxwood or a tea asher in the garden. Our God Yahweh stands in the garden as a mighty cedar with his protective branches spread across all his creation. It is good to have protection because we are like little ants, a people not strong but exceedingly wise. Thank you. 